This is a great audience. Thank you so much for coming. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Mitchell Giddings Fine Arts. Thank you for choosing to spend your evening here with us and artist Matt Brown. Just by being here, you're supporting our gallery and all of our incredible artists. And before I go too much further, I'd also like to thank the Vermont Arts Council, with whom we share a link and space on the Vermont Arts Calendar, Brattleboro Community Television, and Ames Hill Film and Video Productions, Andy Reichsman and Kate Purdy, who film and edit and make available our artist talks and other special events. So we're in for a wonderful evening. Petey and Matt Brown exhibited in a group show about five years ago, and we were struck then by the quality and originality of Matt's woodcuts. It wasn't long after we opened the gallery that we were able to introduce his work into Mitchell Giddings, and I don't remember any time since then when we haven't displayed his prints. Matt travels, teaches, and exhibits widely, but make sure you appreciate the scope of this particular show with its selection, educational aspect, and insights into the creative world of an extraordinary artist. As labor-intensive and demanding as woodblock printmaking is, Matt surrounds and controls it all with an incredible energy, which is a testament to his affection for the path he has chosen. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Matt Brown. Um, so I'm in the habit of when I do talks, I, I, I do an odd thing. Um, I start with questions, and uh, I'd like to do that this evening. Um, uh, it's if I throw it out to you to think of a question or more, just a couple of questions to give me some idea of what you guys might be bringing here this evening, so that I can speak, you know, to your interest. Um, can anybody think of one? It can be ridiculous. Yes. It's, it's really very basic. I'm just curious as to. What kind of wood do you start with? Okay. Yeah. Could you repeat the question? What kind of wood do I carve and print on? So that's, that's a question. Yeah. Did you study in Japan? That is another question. That's an easy one. No, I've never been to Japan. <laughs> of, of all the print mediums available to you, why woodblock? Why woodblock? Cool. There's, there's a question. Yeah. Are you a mem member of the 4,000 Footer Club? Oh, <laughs> that one I can answer like the second question. No, I'm not. But I've, I've climbed a lot of them, but there's some I haven't done. I haven't done, what's the one way up north? Uh, there's some I haven't done, yeah. You had one. Well, yeah. I was going to ask about um, your care for the White Mountains, because I see several scenes from that area. Yeah, so we'll talk about mountains. Yeah, cool. Yeah? Do you use a brush to paint in little details? Oh, uh, to, 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 to brush directly on the prints? No, that's an easy question. No, no, I don't. Yeah. Why Mokahanga instead of other kinds of wood blocks? So that's, that, yeah, that's like that third question. Cool. Yeah. Why, why color wood block? Yeah? Do you work uh, directly from nature sometimes or also from photographs or back and forth? Is that question, do I go out there and, and carve outside with the... Or, drawing or photograph, uh, Yeah, that's a good question, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, this is helpful for me, yeah? Co color, I mean, your, col your color is exquisite. I'd love to hear you talk about color. Talk about color, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. color, yeah. What thoughts come to your mind when you look back at your earlier works? What, what, what was the second word? What? What thoughts come to your mind when you look back at your earlier works? Oh yeah, what what is what is the what is making what does the making art evoke? What is it? Is it, it's a hell of a or it's a, it's quite a paper trail that you can make when you're making art. What is that? What is that? How does that work? Uh, some other ones. Oh, how do you get the hard details on? You mean that the, the yeah that the. the Tight little detail and stuff, yeah, and the carving. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. We could do that one with the first question about the woods. Wow, this is really helpful for me. Any others? I think what I might do, um, actually, we'll just take a moment and we'll talk a little bit about our timing. One couple has shared that they're, you're, you guys are leaving at 6. And <clears throat> how would people feel? What time is it now? About quarter past 5? 10. Ten. 10 past 5. How about we go till just a tad before six, and then we kind of like 
take a breather and check in, see how we're doing. That'll give you guys an opportunity to leave without embarrassing the, <laughs> the speaker. And, um, uh, um, and um, maybe I'll just take uh, five minutes to do a little introduction. Maybe there'll be another five that addresses those questions. And then I've handed out uh, to a few people in the audience, um, uh, there are four topics that I like to talk uh, to. And a few of you have seen them on the sheet circulating around. If you have the sheet and you want to just pass it around while we're going, people can take a look at it. And sort of in my mind, it's one of four themes that we might get into this evening. And based on the questions so far, I'm thinking, and I, I will read them out. Um, I'm thinking we might do, there's one topic called wood and water, making prints using the Honga method. And that's, that's a neat topic. There's another topic, it's probably my favorite one, and people often do vote. And if they vote for one of the others, they'll, they'll say, well, can't you squeak that in? And that's the energy theory of color, right? And that, that, that's, that's, that's one I really like to talk on. But, um, uh, uh, well, I might share uh, the story of how I got onto this printmaking method. I think there were two questions related to why mokuhanga, why printing with water, why using Japanese method. So um, my mom was an art teacher, and both my sister and I, uh, we got a lot of art when we were kids. And so it's somewhat in my um, habit and, um, and in my... Um, in my activity of how to survive <laughs> in life. And um, uh, I was an art major in college and um, graduated, well, you know, that was great. And they, you know, the, the, I got good marks. They thought I did, you know, really got off onto a neat concept, but how could you make a dollar at that? And I worked for about 10, 15 years, I think, as a carpenter and cabinet maker, where I live now in Lyme, New Hampshire, just up the river from where we are tonight. And um, when our first boy, Nathaniel, was born, there was an exhibit at Dartmouth's Hood Museum of uh, Hiroshige's 53 stations of the Takedo. So some of you, how many people are like sort of familiar with Japanese prints? They kind of know what that, what that the, the most people have some image. Usually if people say, oh, I don't really know what you're talking about, Japanese prints, what is that? And then I go, well, you know, Hokusai, the great wave, and then they go, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so now does every, you know, that image of the great wave? That, that, that's a Japanese print made just in, in this, using this method. So that's what this exhibit was, and it's sort of a famous series, I think from the 1830s, so I'm not sure the exact date. At any rate, um, it was mostly where I was in my life at that time that, I, that, that, that made this light bulb come on. But I saw a number of things in those prints. I went to the exhibit several times and um, really laid out uh, in the concept um, what's been now 25 years of pursuit. I think two or three years later, I had already closed up pretty much for good my work as a, uh, as a builder <clears throat> and uh, went full time. Uh, in this effort of making these prints using water, multiple blocks, Japanese method. One of the qualities of those prints that really attracted me was the soft look of the color. It's, it, this, is, this is printing with water, and uh, sometimes in books you'll see the reference to uh, fresco. It's when, uh, uh, if you think of oil painting compared to like fresco painting. Um, uh, a fresco painting is done where you're laying colors, pigments, right in, to, if, it's, if it's true fresco, it's into fresh plaster. And the light finds that pigment in the medium of the plaster, and there's a very soft, attractive, you know, kind of subtle in there look to that, to that which watercolor has, and which um, I've found the, uh, the Japanese prints have. They have this soft, Sort of look to the deep look to the color. Another quality that I saw in those prints was that it's collaborative art. It was a team that made these prints. And um, oh, my wife 
at the, uh, were, were no longer married, but she had a significant Buddhist practice. And uh, uh, much of that, I was uh, uh, learning uh, to meditate and whatnot at that time too. And I felt like there was a little less of the artist's ego in those prints, because the artist did the design, Hiroshige did the design, but another shop carved them and another shop would print them. And so, so they, the, the prints have a sort of life of their own. And um, also, as a builder, I was really attracted to the idea of imagery that's built. You know, it's, it's, it's block by block, and it's, it's also imagery, uh, it's a process where uh, an image idea is taken apart and put back together. And you, I, I could kind of sense that, but mostly I was looking at those things going like, wow, how do they make those? And, uh, and it became a number of years of experiment and largely working in isolation until, um, ooh, the opening of the internet. This was 1993, and then the internet gets going, if you might remember, 97, 98, we start using the internet. And, um, and that was quite helpful for me. Um, and so I'm largely self-taught at this, but then I've had a lot of different relationships. Never been to Japan, but I've gone there in my dreams. And also, uh, there's one particular printmaker in Tokyo who I uh, connected with in the internet, on the internet. He came and visited, actually, David Bull, and that was quite helpful, certain technical uh, things. Like, um. So there was the question about the wood, and um, uh, early on I was carving woods that I had and worked with, and uh, still I, I work with four basic woods, birch, uh, cherry, poplar, and basswood. Uh, the birch and the cherry are harder woods, and the harder woods is how you get, what's your name? Elliot. Elliot? Yeah, Elliot. If you want really like delicate and each wood will have sort of, in the carving, the shapes will come out different. And so if I want like a, a print that's just a little more like, you know, sharper shapes and a little, I don't know, a little more intricate, I'll, I'll carve cherry or birch. But if I want shapes that feel more fluid or something, I might, I might use basswood or poplar. Um, let's see, did we field the questions? There was the question about, yeah, did, did, have we already fielded the why Mokohanga, the, the, the attraction to the look? Um, it, it, it turns out that the story of, of, the, of the Japanese method is fascinating. And uh, one of the things that was going on for me early on when I got onto this uh, path of this printmaking method um, is the story of the Japanese prints and their influence on, um, on modern Western art, particularly through the Impressionist painters and whatnot in France, but others as well. The, uh, the opening of Japan and Japanese uh, aesthetic had a big influence on arts and crafts movement in this country around the turn of the century. It's fascinated by uh, um, an artist um, and um, sort of art theorist, uh, Arthur Dow. Some of you might know this fellow who lived and worked. Well, he, he, uh, he taught at Art Students Leaving in New York, but he had digs in Ipswich, Mass. Made beautiful little color prints. Um, does this answer the, all the questions that came up? Are we, are we clear? Did, is there something hanging? Maybe we'll move on. Um, okay, so the, um, oh. Often in the questions, there's a focus on, um, well, how do you do it? <laughs> how does it work? Uh, of course, I know how to, it works, so it's, that's not as interesting to me as some of the other topics. But maybe we might take a moment and collectively think, because I've brought um, materials to do demonstration here and whatnot. And the most recent talk I did was about a month ago. And we did the same thing. I threw it out to the group. The, and I think we had the same set of four topics. And we did, I think we did more than one of them. And I remember doing the demo printing later. Um, and that was fun, and, and um, recently um, I met up with a woman who had been at that talk, and she said, oh yes, and you gave me a print 
from the you pulled up the demo, and and I framed it and I have it in. <laughs> so that's kind of interesting. Um, and um, I actually brought those same blocks and all. But I want to take a moment and get this right. Do we do the work first, or do we? Everybody looks attentive and, and thinking. I'd sort of rather do the, the, the printing later, because is that, is that? Yeah, and do the, you know, we're, 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 we're keyed and focused. All right. So the four topics are East meets West, a short history of Japanese prints in Japan and in Europe and the Americas. So this is sort of a broad brush thing, and, and the Matt Brown story just fits in a little bit here and there. The second topic, wood and water, making prints using the Hanga method. So that's focused more on the, on the how-to, and we've already addressed a little bit, you know, the water idea, the wood idea. The third topic, which part craft, which part art? And that, that, that's an interesting topic from the point of view of printmaking is a, it's a little different than, um, I, there was a question about how do the prints get made? Do, do I do drawings? Do I work from photographs, et cetera, et cetera? And that's a, that's, this topic addresses that. That'd be a nice one. And then, and then my favorite, the energy theory of color. So uh, would anybody like to speak up for one or more of those topics? Martha. Well, we both agreed on the energy theory of color. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Okay. There's two votes for that one. <laughs> Yeah. I'd love to see the demo. Okay. <laughs> yeah. People, yeah, yeah. Energy theory, Energy theory of color. Oh, yeah. Craft and art. Craft and art. Because what we could do is we could, like, knock off craft and art fast, do the energy theory of color, and save the demo as the, like, high point of the evening. What does that sound like? Does that, is that amenable? All right, we need a timekeeper, though, because I think it'd be nice if, if I was starting to do the demo at, let's say, quarter to six. All right, and that way, because... Yeah, I'll keep time if you want. Jim will be the timekeeper, okay. And then at, at six, we'll kind of take a break. The demo will be going. We, there might be some getting up and walking around it a little bit. And then who knows, we might go after one of the other topics or, or we could see what, what, what you guys do. I, I can't imagine you do talks for a full two hours from five to seven. Yeah, okay. All right. All right, so that's good. So, so we're talking now at 25 minutes. And I think we can do the art and craft in like, like five or 10 minutes. And then we can, energy if color gets like 15, 20 minutes. Okay, so this, this idea came, there was, it was New England, College in Henniker had a series of speakers uh, to address this topic: uh, which part art, which part craft, and um, <clears throat> yeah. So this is this is how it reads on the sheet: which part craft, which part art. Craft is that which can be learned and repeated. Art is that which is unique. Let's talk about it. <laughs> All right. So that's my little definition there. It's like if you take um, brushing your teeth. Um, we all learn that craft of how to brush our teeth. But there's variations in how we might go at it. And every once in a while, on some morning, we introduce a little art to it. Something special, something unique about how we put our toothpaste to our toothbrush. Or, you know, how we... Uh, this, this is the way I think of this. And so all activities have evolved some art, and all activities involve some craft. And the two things are working together in everything we do. Um, in this printmaking, <clears throat> I have a friend who prints for other artists mostly, and he's often working for the galleries and whatnot. And he and I agree that when it comes to printmaking, and Bill uh, is a good friend and fellow printmaker here. Um, many of you may know Bill Hayes. And I'll be curious what you think about this. I would say printmaking is about 90% housekeeping, about 6% uh, craft, and 4% art. What do you think about that one? <laughs> well, the 
the 4% comes at the beginning. Yes. You come up with the idea. The idea is the unique part. Right. And your motivation right. for that right. makes it art or craft. If you're doing a vase of flowers because you know that vases of red flowers sell at galleries and you create an edition of prints, you've got a craft. But if you take those flowers and weave them into an environment that's expressive of what you're feeling at the time, and you don't give a damn about what's going to sell in the gallery, that's art. <laughs> the idea that you are, that it's craft comes from the fact that you're making multiples. But I'm sure that you'll demonstrate and, and confirm that despite the fact that you are making an edition of multiple images, every one of them is different. Is unique. And, and in a way, I would um, propose an amendment and, and offer that in some ways there is some art in every, you know, at the end as well. The, the, the last move, the last color laid in, um, even um, <clears throat> the move of like uh, deciding where that, where that print might hang, like the, a, a potential um, owner of that print deciding to, to put it in a certain spot in their house, that's a piece of work in and of itself and it involves some art for that, for that to be done. Yeah, question. I'd just like to say it so depends on the kind of printmaking because some printmaking is composed right on the press and it's maybe 75% art. Yeah. So I just needed yeah. to say monotypes and some other forms of printmaking are mostly art. Yes, yes, yes. And I've also had the experience, I would say, there's a painter I love, a lot of people like this painter, um, uh, the Dutch painter Vermeer, for instance. And there was a nice big exhibit of his uh, paintings in Washington at the National Gallery in 1996. And I remember being in there and thinking, wow, there's a lot of craft in these paintings and really admiring the, the, the craft. Um, the art often goes farther if there's a lot of good craft to um, uh, support it. The two are, are, you know, working together. How do you, how do you think about this, uh, this definition that Matt Brown just offered up? What's your first name? Cecil. Cecil. What do, you, what do you think of this one? Is it handy? Well, I would have taken you to task if you hadn't said that there was some of each feeding the other one. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah the, two, the two work you know, they, 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 they work together uh, in this concept. Are we ready for, uh, any, any more thought? Yes, yeah. Do you think this is an important distinction, at art or craft? And um, what about the concept of beauty versus uniqueness? I, I don't think uniqueness is, a, is an, an important enough definition for art. So, say that last again. You said, as I heard it, that the difference, what made it art was the uniqueness. And I'm asking about beauty. Yeah, beauty, 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 um, beauty. So his, his um, observation is uh, a question, I guess. Where does the beauty come in? First I said, do you think it's important to make a distinction between craft and art? In other words, you're implying right. that making of the choice or making of the evaluation is important to ask or question. Yeah. And then you use your definition around craft is something that is learned right. and art is something that is unique. Right. So right. I'm questioning whether uniqueness is a, a meaningful definition of art and what about beauty? Yeah. Craft is beautiful, can be. Yes, yes, yes. Um, well, I think it's handy to have the two distinctions because um, we talk about art, and we talk about craft, and it comes up at times. Um, for instance, I'm a juror uh, for the League of New Hampshire Craftsman Print Jury, and when we jury printmakers, we do it really based on craft. And we leave the art part uh, aside, more or less. Um, so we're just we're just juring or judging based on the implementation of craft aspects. So as a juror, I'm looking for things that get repeated, um, you know, patterns in in a printmaker's work, 
that are dependable and repeated and whatnot. The, the matter of uniqueness and beauty, um, wow, I'd like to take a minute and take a stab at something. This is just letting my mind go and talk from the point of view of the experience of music and what and why do we find beauty in music and it's my belief or understanding that um, <clears throat> a lot of our enjoyment of music comes from uh, a balance between things that we recognize and things that are a little bit new and fresh and innovative and that can change sometimes we want we find music that's beautiful, that we know really well, that's reassuring, that's, uh, you know, learned patterns, and that's what we want. Sometimes we want music that's more innovative, that's more unique, that's a new sound. And a lot of music that we would call beautiful plays with that dynamic. You know, there's, there's recognizable tones and rhythms and patterns in music. But there's also in it the need for innovation. I think we have the same instinct for most everything in our lives. We want things that we, you know, recognize and can work with. You know, we can't, we can't reinvent er the whole car every time. But we also want something fresh each moment. You know, part of what's interesting about this talk both for me and for you, is we don't really know what's going to happen next. <laughs> right? you know? And your question is interesting to me because I don't know how I'm going to answer it. And in a way, that's, that's for me, is beauty. And um, the title of this show, Con Conversations with this medium, is I actually find in living, um, in maybe the most beautiful thing is to be in conversation with another person, with a landscape, with a work of art, with a, with a piece of music. And that I find, I experience that, that's how I experience beauty, I guess. It's my, um, yeah. I got two. Um, yeah. I, I, he asked if it was important, the distinction. Yeah. Uh, I don't know about you, but I encounter it when I am dealing with galleries and the audience that people sometimes have a preconception that printmaking is a craft. Mm -hmm. And then people look at your prints and it transcends that. Right. And so people who deal with crafts will say, well, your prints are art. Uh -huh. Yeah. So you can't win. Yeah. Well, this is, well, maybe. But this is why I often start with the toothbrush analogy, because it can be as simple and humble as brushing your teeth can still involve this dynamic. It doesn't have to be, you know, an art it, 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 to, to think of this dynamic, it seems to me. But you, there's a... Uh... I was going to say that, uh, that they feel very different. Um, if you're an artist that also does craft, that um, in a way with craft, you kind of know the landscape and you know what you're reaching for. You know what excellence is. Whereas the art, and they blur, but and the art is when you don't know what you're reaching for, and it's a whole new mm. universe, and you're finding it. That's what I have. Yeah. Exploration, experiment, and yeah. Should we move on to the energy theory of color? <laughs> yeah. Good. All right. All right. All right. Where, where, where are we at with time? It's 5:30. Okay. We have 15 minutes. Wow. All right, I'm going to read a little bit of what I've written out here as a way to jump into it. And then maybe I'll tell a little story. And hopefully that'll be about six or seven minutes in. And then we'll discuss as we just have been doing. Does this sound all right? How are you doing, Elliot? Good. Good. <laughs> our enjoyment of color and our perception of it as connected to our perception of differences and relationships in our world. Our optic nerves depend on movement and differences and contrast to perceive color. 
Our approach to processing visual information is built out of our interest in assessing relationships of energy in the world around us. We enjoy, I think this is notes to myself and I need to, I need to share them with you in a more, um, in a more um, accessible manner. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, on my drive down, I thought a little bit about how I might like to tackle this um, topic this time around, and thought I might share the story of some past presentations on the topic. One time, I jumped into this um, theory, which actually got developed by myself long before I started working with, uh, as a printmaker. It was soon after college um, and sort of beset with the issue of how to think about color and playing around as a, as a, with some painting. And I, basically I painted and draw, drew since college. I, I just kept working as a, it wasn't my work. Um, but at any rate. Um, and I came up with this idea that I called it the energy theory of color. And I guess in college I had done some, there had been some color discussion and color work, but um, in some ways it's, it, this theories are certain, somewhat scant. And um, I remember uh, jumping in on this idea. I'm going to tell you the, the, the comment that came up afterwards and then go back to the idea the way I presented it at that talk which is a guy, he had been done graduate work in color, I think he was, he was psychology, and he, he said, well, uh, you're onto something there, but um, uh, you, you, you gotta refine it, we gotta get together and talk. And we still, Michael and I still haven't done this, but the, basically the point that I was making was that um, color really has its, um, meaning and its, um, uh, we, our, our relationship with it is entirely uh, uh, built of, of uh, relationship. It's, it's a relative thing. Um, you know, if you're a student of modern physics, uh, one of the qualities of modern life is, is uh, that we've come to understand that our world really doesn't have any absolute reference points. And uh, it's Einstein who sort of, you know, made that shift in our thinking. And there's a lot of realms in which we can think of things as being relative. And, and, and I experience color as a very relative um, arena. And, and the quality that I look for in colors when I think of their relationships, um, I think of them in energy terms. And a good way to describe what I'm talking about is, um, is the analogy of eating a meal. And I like to use the uh, image of going out to a sushi bar or something, and on your plate is that wasabi and that cool ginger, and you got your hot and your cold. And um, when you're enjoying or talking to somebody about a Japanese meal, a lot of times they'll talk in terms of like, hot and cool and, and basically you're just, you're tasting stuff, you're tasting stuff. And I actually think that as a species and, and we, we, we evolved to ascertain energy differences in our, in our world. Turns out Michael was on to something as a, as a researcher in color perception. And he said, well, yes, if you had uniform light energy coming into your eyes, and it was all the same light energy, you would not see any color. We, we, we need varied light energy to see color. So, so does, does this, is, am I, is this working at all for anybody here? Okay, so then um, that, that was interesting. So he was almost saying to me, yes, there's something about the way we perceive color has a lot to do with this perception of like differences in the light energy. So this winter, I was renting my house to a family from China. And the, the, the dad of this family, they were back from China in line because he had been a professor at Dartmouth for a number of years and their three daughters were homesick for Lyme. 
And he and I got into conversation. He's a professor of psychology specializing in visual perception. And he explained to me that <clears throat> our, there are two things. One, if our eyes were truly still, if they weren't moving, rapidly moving, we would see no color. And he also said, again, just what Michael had said at the end of that talk. He said, yeah, if we had light, if we have light energy coming in that's uniform, we won't see any color to it. We, we, our, 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 cone, our nerve cells pick up on differences in the energy levels to make the colors. So, all right, so here's a sentence in here. Enjoying the convention of the picture space is dynamic and temporal. It's more like our enjoyment of music than one might think. It's a realm where we delve in, taste, and enjoy the experience of energy relationships, the experience of moving through arrangements of darks and lights, patterns, and color. So if we picked, I mean, let's pick these Kunisada prints that are back on the wall behind us here. There's uh, a couple of sort of dominant things going on that, that I might sort of point out as we perceive those prints. There's some, there's some white and gray areas, you know, some, some areas without a lot going on. And there's a, there's a really strong, uh, uh, you know, that's a lovely red, like a burnt sienna red and that deep indigo blue. Um, those are the, that's the dominant color relationship. And look how marked it is. And with that, with that Daimaro symbol uh, back there, the, and the pattern, look at on the, the, the two on the right, look at that, that deep dark blue with a, with a white pattern there. It's just visually so um, heightened, strong contrast. So that's very active. And then, and then, but then if you go into the kimonos that are shown, those, those color relationships are, are much closer and tight. There's not nearly the contrast. And if, if for instance, Kunisada had laid those out with really strong contrast, it, it, it would not be so satisfying for us because it'd be like too much. And, and so I guess that what I might share about it is in our enjoyment of color, we want you know, it's like with music, we want this balance. We want some contrast and heightened, you know, we want that, that ginger and that wasabi, but then we want another course of, uh, you know, sash uh, sashimi that's, that's just mellow and just little subtle differences. Does this make sense? Is this like, I mean, this is how I think about mixing my colors. This is how I go at it. And I, I, I don't think in terms of, you know, the color wheel. And uh, I, I do think a little bit in terms of if you're, if you're a painter or, you know, if you're making, you start with that white sheet of paper. And that's like all the light energy coming back at you. And you, as you lay those colors in, you're just, you're just dampening things down. You know, you're dampening it, dampening it back. You know, and inviting, inviting participation in. And you pick your colors so that it's there's, they they yeah they they complement, and you try to sense the energy of it, just like you might be cooking a nice meal and getting the right amount of salt and pepper. All right, does somebody want to jump in? You know, like oh Matt, you got it all wrong. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Notice something. See those in those kimonos, like especially the two in the middle, that middle panel. They're mostly blues and grays. But look at the, just the little bit of the, of the redder, these, these little, can I just? See how he just slips a little bit of this? It's not the same red as here. It's a little lighter. And then just a little bit, just to kind of, but not too much. And that's an energy relationship. Yeah. Now, when you're doing your uh, prints, what medium of light do you use? Natural light? LED lighting? So, oh, yeah. So my shop is um, the, where we might most do most of the print work is uh, the top floor of a, it's a three-story building, and we have these, a pair of north-facing skylights. And that's where most of the real printing happens under those, under those because skylights. Because it's like, say, if you're, if you're doing your, that, that medium with that light, 
and then you go to a gallery, a lot of times you're not going to get the same. Oh, yeah. This is why, one of the reasons why a theory that basically emphasizes relativity, rel relativeness, is, a, in my opinion, more robust because it recognizes that the light is always different. It's never, you cannot control, you really can't control color. All, all the pigments are, are they're just, they're just um, you know, they're just affecting the light that's bouncing back to our eyes. And the light that you throw at it, at that, at that paper, that pigmented paper, if you throw different colored light or different quality of light, you're going to get different colors back. So it's really a matter of setting up those colors so they have nice relationships so they, it, 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 does this make sense? Yeah, yeah. You, you cannot, I mean, it's such a complex um, uh, set of things to play with. I mean, and sometimes people say, oh, you're an artist, what do you love? I say, yeah, well, I just, I just play with shapes and colors. And playing with colors is, can get, you know, pretty involving, yeah. How are we doing for time now, Jim? It's 5.45. Uh-huh. Well, any, one more little comment or question before we get into the demo? We got one, yeah. Well, I have a question. You have such excitement over color and all these pieces. And it, um, do you do every stage of your prints? Like you were saying with the Japanese artist that you were speaking of, that he had other people perform the, other, the stages of the print. The, Oh, how is my work, you know, uh, like or unlike the way that those prints were made, the Japanese right. prints, ukiyo-e prints? Um, each and every stage. Yes, but I have helped printing significantly. So I would say that um, I am, it is collaborative art at this point. Um, I've worked with a, actually uh, some folks may know a woman, uh, Susan Berry, I think, teaches at the Putney School, her sister-in-law, uh, Liz Gunther, and I have worked together for 10 years now or so. And so um, I would say that in the printing and the color work, I mean, <laughs> we're going along and, you know, Liz will say, well, this color, I'll go up to where I have. Uh, my colors are largely either just, just straight pigments or um, there's a company down in New York where the fellow's putting just pigment to water. It's actually a cool, you know, for any water medium, this is a good, good, good way to buy a Gara paint and pigment. And I'll be up there mixing the colors, and uh, that's when I'm thinking the energy stuff, and she's, she's you know, she, she may or may not care about the energy theory of color. <laughs> but but uh, that's our language. That's our language. The, Printing itself, there's a lot of ways to control the, the color, and, and really there are a lot of ways that color, we perceive color and it changes beyond just the hue. And, and the intensity and the, um, the values of your colors can be affected continually in the printing, which might be a good segue into a little printing. So, um, uh, I think we'll just turn this. Now, can everybody see okay? This, this could, um, it, I, I could see this degenerating into people standing up, coming around as a big group and stuff. But for now, why don't you hold your seats? And I think I'll, I'll, I'll technically walk us through it. Does that make sense? Are people interested in that? Okay, so it starts with um, a drawing. Oh. I'll show it to you this way. I was Friday morning showing prints to Sarah Thompson, the curator of Japanese prints at the MFA. And recently, on a trip to London, a fellow who was in college with me, Izzy Goldman, has been since college. We graduated the same year from Harvard. And Izzy's been a dealer of Japanese prints ever since over in London. We got a bunch of stuff where we connect and share. And he sold me. Let's see, where is it here? Somewhere right in here. A Kunisada drawing. And I'm so pleased to share this statistic. 
The MFA owns over 10,000 prints by this artist, Kuni Sada. That's a lot of prints by one artist. They don't own any drawings. And this is an actual drawing. <laughs> <laughs> it's so cool. I'm not going to pass it around, but. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was pretty poker faced when, when, when we went along with Izzy. Izzy actually had two of them. And I saw the first one and I was like, oh, that's cool. How much you want for that? And um, he said, and I was like, oh. And then there was the second one. And I was like, this was so much better than the first one. And then finally, I was like, so how much do you want for that one? And when he said, I think he wanted to sell it to me. He quoted me the same price. I was like, mm, I think that's what I'm doing. <laughs> so um, uh, actually, there's a really amazing story with this print. Can I share it? So I bought this from Izzy on a Tuesday. We were talking about, have anybody seen this movie, Loving Vincent? Yeah. Um, so we were talking about that a little bit. I'd seen that not so long ago. And, and I asked him about, he says, oh, there's a show at the, at the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam right now. Van Gogh in Japan. He had the catalog. I think he'd seen this show. <clears throat> so it's all about the influence of Japanese prints, well, mostly on Van Gogh, but not just on Van Gogh, on, on, on those artists of that time in France. And um, I was pretty keenly interested, well, how many, you know, was he looking at, I knew, we know he look, was looking at Hiroshige prints or bought them, but he had quite a collection. He bought them in a, in, a, in, a, on a, in a kind of a rash time. He bought a whole bunch of them, sort of thought he might become print dealer. How many of them were Kunisada prints? It turns out about a third of his collection, which were about 600 prints, are, were designed by this artist Kunisada that I'm so interested in. Um, at any rate, Izzy said, you got to go, you got to go to, to Amsterdam. And I did a one day trip. And in his collection was a image that I could recognize was from this same series of, of this. And I haven't been able to find it anywhere else. And Sarah Thompson actually told me, she said, we don't have any prints from this series. It's, the series is um, Modern Sparrows of Edo or something. So it's, it's portraits of women of you know, sort of well-known women or famous women in, living in Edo, which is modern-day Tokyo, in 1835. That's when he made this drawing with the brush, laid it in. So then, um, this is only about four or five days ago. Um, oh, I put a little Facebook post up with the drawing and the image from the Van Gogh show. It's on my Facebook page. And about three days ago, this email drops in. Actually. I found it in my spam folder. It said Kunisada drawing. I thought, damn, these, these spammers, now they pick up on your Google searches because I've been doing Google searches for, are there very many drawings out there? And there are a few, but they'd all been sold. I can't tell what the, you know, what it's about. At any rate, no, it was not spam. It was a guy who lives in Arlington, Massachusetts. He bought some of my prints. He knows my prints. And that's why he was sort of on my Facebook page. He says, I don't do Facebook, his email read, but my wife does. And it came in, your Cooney saw the drawing, I have that print. I was oh, like, wow. you gotta be kidding me. Because Sarah and I assumed what this drawing was. The way it works is you would do a drawing, you do a drawing, Martha's taking my class, you paste the drawing face down on a block, and you carve through the block. That's how we get our imagery on the block. So this drawing would be fa pasted face down on the, on the block and Carver would carve through it. It's one of the reasons why there are not very many drawings. They all got carved up. Almost no drawings. Like the MFA has just a, just a couple Hiroshi Gate drawings and that's it. So why, I, you know, I, I haven't seen his print actually, but he sent me an image of it and there's a, there's a few little differences. And you know, what's the relationship between this print this drawing and, and the print, we'll find out. I mean, I'll, I'll have to see the print. And I'll, but that's the story. I mean, in a way, it's an amazing Facebook story because the chances of that are so. OK, so you, the, 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 that's the way the carving goes. Whenever I'm carving, I'm always carving through a paper pa pasted face down on the block. And there's a block. Um, uh, oh. So for instance, here, I did a. Um, black line drawing. This is a 
New York City scene. You could imagine that this is a, a, a drawing, but it's actually sketch painting on a block printed just one color, the way they would have done it here. This, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so this drawing was, was intended, uh, Kunisada did it with a single line. This would get carved and printed. Then he would mark on there for the various color blocks is how all these prints were made. We've sort of opened that up. We don't necessarily rely on what's that, what that, that would be called a key block or a key block drawing where there's a, there's a dominant line that carries the image idea. Most of these prints don't have that line. It's a, it's a more open-ended conversation. And that's what's going on here. I have, um, I'm going to put this away. Um, I have blocks here uh, from a print from way back. And I have been playing around with it with the idea of doing a second state version. And um, what I'm going to show you here is, um, eh, this is more or less, it's just a proof, but this is more or less where we're getting into. Um, Liz laid some of these in, and last weekend I was down at Boston Print Fair, and I, this is what I worked on. And I think what I'm going to do is just take a couple blocks and print them. Sound all right? Um, I can even leave a few things out for you just so you can be looking at stuff um, here while I, while I lay in some color. Okay, so oh, we'll just use this towel. Yeah, all right, here's a block that's, that wasn't printed on this sheet or this sheet, we'll just lay it right in, or that sheet, we'll, we'll lay that in. So the papers need to be damp all through the printing. And in fact, controlling your moisture is one of the more challenging parts of this, uh, of this craft. Um, you need to keep your moisture consistent. Paper will change size. Well, I'm not finding the color that we have here, so we're going to just wing it. With our energy theory of color in hand, we don't have to worry so much about hues. We can go wrong with confidence. <laughs> oh, um, so the printing is with water and pigment and a little rice paste which I cook in the kitchen ahead of time. And it's the starch in the rice paste that allows you, or you need it, to control the, the pigment particles in the water. There's passages in some of these prints. Here's an example. This is no paste, just water, very open texture in the printing. You, you need rice paste to get good solid color. OK, so ooh, I wanted a little yellow. I had some colors. Uh, there was a, all right, here. So we're just going to do something here, right? Actually, we're going to kind of. So um, on this block is um, a little paste and some pigment. And. Uh, and we've just set up a little fade of a yellow coming into a blue, going back into a yellow again. All right. In the corner of the block is a right angle, and here we have a carved straight. And we're going to use those for registration. So I take my paper, set it to those kento, they're called. And, uh, and then I take my baron, so instead of a press, uh, we're using this handheld baron, so it's the baron and a body is the press, and uh, rub that paper, or press that paper um, to the block. Probably won't print real well the first time. The block needs to warm up and get uh, saturated with color. But I do want to show you, pull that print, that we've just, we've just laid that in 
And I can, I can, that color is in the, in the paper. How come we didn't see the green and the yellow? Um, what's the question? So, so, so you put green that went into yellow, then went back into green, and I didn't see that on the paper. Is that very light? Or uh, well, we'll do it again. I'm going to lay the same print in again just to get this block going. And then what I could do, if I go on a blank sheet of paper, you'll see it. I'll do that next, and then I think you'll see it. I should have a rag here. OK, so, so I'll just lay this in one more time, just to impress you about how accurate the registration can be. <laughs> it's, it's, it's um, uh, you know, there, there's some things about the craft part that got very well worked out here. Um, By those, by the, by the, in that, through that Japanese. So, you know, you see it. Um, well, uh, here, I'll, I'll do this one now. And uh, I think you'll see, because that, that there we'll have a before and after. So here's, here's a little of that blue. Take my paper. I guess what it is, is at this moment, this to me is pretty much all craft. You know, it's a thing of just, when you're printing, a lot of it is just good, clean work. That's, it's just craft. You're just trying to print. But then when you decide which color and what fade and how much paste, that's a little more art. OK. so. Do you see a difference between these two? Mm -hmm. So that the difference is what we just laid in. Now I'll do it on a blank sheet, which I have here, and you'll see you'll see more clearly what this. Yeah. What kind of paper? Um, this is a French uh, cotton paper called Reeves Heavyweight. So it's Arches is the is the company. Here we go on a blank sheet. Now here we'll try, those are a little messy. Let's try and do this nice clean printing. So I print sitting down at a, print, at a bench. I never really print like this. It's sort of uncomfortable. But uh, we tend to print sitting cross-legged on a on a low bench. There might be pictures of it somewhere or something. So I'm going to lay it in again, actually, just to get it so it looks a little better. If you look closely at my prints or at the Kunisada prints or Japanese prints in general, you'll see a couple different things. There's a lot of texture to what's going on. Oh, see right in here is maybe needs a little more pressure. I just didn't quite do that quite. Yeah. Um, you'll see there's a little bit of wood grain in there. There's a little bit of the brush mark. And sometimes we try very hard not to get barren marks, but, but in, in, in a number of the Japanese prints, you, you can see a lot of the barren marks. And it's nice. It's nice because you, you can see how they're made. You can see that they're made by hand and all. Um, is it 6 o'clock now? Yes. Well, you guys, you got a, you got a, play, you got a, uh, a film to catch. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for coming. It was great. All right. All right, now let's just all take a deep breath. Where do we, where, and, and think for a moment where we're gonna, where we're gonna go from here. Are we gonna put Matt to a bunch more printing? Or am I gonna show 
you guys the print that Bill and I are working. We're working on a print. It's big. That'll be fun. We might do that. Um, we could talk about the, the, the exhibit. Which one, which one is finished? I couldn't, I couldn't tell. Which one is finished? Which is your favorite? Yeah. Oh, which is my favorite? Or oh, which do you think is finished? Well, which one am I most interested in, like, looking at? You don't need to work anymore. Well, they all, they all have something to say, but that's the one I'd want to have on the wall. That, that to me, has the most going on. Yeah, question? I was just wondering, for, for somebody who was starting with literally nothing, but for someone who was aspiring to do something exactly like this, what, what would you say is like the essential tools and items that you would encourage somebody to if you want to start playing around with Hanga printmaking, where do you start? Yeah, I mean, what, what would you say to someone, like, these are the essentials that you're going to need if you want to at least get the bare minimum? Well, the best thing to do is, is to sign up to take my class. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had done that. <laughs> it would have been so much easier. <laughs> Although, they say that if it's easy, you're, you're, you're not going you know, you know, to get bit by the bug. Um, so, uh, well, um, I mean, the essential aspect of this activity is printing with water. And I'm using brushes and the Baron. And right there, you run into two, they are, um, it's deceptive. The brushes look simple, like little shoe brushes. Actually, like when I'm teaching the class, we do brush preparation and stuff. Most people don't really take it in because the brushes have been prepared and burned and worked this way and that way. You can still print with a shoe brush, though. You can innovate. Um, uh, you can also print. Uh, you don't have to use rice paste. You can use gum arabic. You can use methyl cellulose. There are other things you could use besides cooking rice, which isn't hard. Cooking rice paste is not hard. Um, uh, How about carving? Carving's, uh, maybe I'll show just a little bit of carving. I mean, when I, it, when I teach it in the class, I, I don't say too much about carving except for a little bit on safety and, and how to sharpen your tools because I think that's a... a um, it's kind of personal. And I, I love the way, like in the class, different people's carving, you know, it just the way the printing demonstrates. But understanding sure. carving and what is going to be um, printed, that fellow asked, what do you need to know? Well, I mean, what can you know? I mean, I've carved for, you know, a lot of prints and blocks, but it's a discovery every time. I mean, I, I, I carve with an intention, but you got to print it to see. Martha took the class, and you, you, you go at it, and you, you proof it, and then you see what you got. And if, if it doesn't seem to work, you make a change. Isn't that pretty much? Yeah. So, but I carve. This will be. That downplays the skill that, that one can develop in one's ability to carve one's intent. Mm -hmm. Maybe, perhaps. I mean, one thing that's interesting about the, the, you know, and now I'm more on the Japanese, like when you took the class, I wasn't all talking about Kunisada, was I? It's been since then. It was really the exhibit at the MFA that got me onto it. And now I'm on a whole different tack. And yeah, Bill. I'd say in carving, the logic is so simple. What you carve does not print. Right. That's the best, and, right. And carving, generally speaking, is not spontaneous. It's something that takes some care and is done slowly. And so it, it, it takes some degree of planning. Right. But having said that about the simple logic, it quickly gets, especially for a beginner, it gets so complicated, you can't figure out what you're supposed to be carving. To think, because you're working in reverse. And, going to fit in, and then yeah. people say, but everything you print is backwards. And I, I always say, that doesn't matter at all. If it's going to work <laughs> yeah. right to left, it'll work left to right. right. 
So with your fades, is that a question of the water, or is that a question of the starch, or uh, the, 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 how you press on it, or a combination of both? Well, a combination of both. But we did, you know, there is a fade right here. This is, uh, you know, it is going from a, a, a yellow-green into a blue back to a yellow-green. And we did it, the way we set that up <coughs> is you can kind of see it on the brush. It's bluer on this side of the brush and yellower on this side of the brush. And I just kept the brush working that way. And that's how I, so if it's on the brush and it's on the block, it'll be on the print. Well, I was thinking more about the, 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 the blue of the sky, the way it, it sort of gets darker. So, so that's a question of, of the amount of pigment that you put on one end or uh, the amount of water you use or this is this is. This, this here is um, is color with paste going into just paste. Oh, okay. So it's the it's the starch. Yes, and and, and just holding back on the color. It's just you know, avoiding, you know, and and. So I and, take it the the, the paper is like super absorbent. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're not going to have water like so, so going over on the side. Um, well, yeah, you just. There's, you just print, and, and I mean, if you use too much stuff, it's too much stuff, and you, you, you back off. But um, actually, this paper is not as absorbent as the Japanese papers. But it, well, you, you saw how it, it takes up the color. And um, uh, here, it's, it's going, as I mentioned, probably no paste. And I've got like a little green going into kind of a rosy purple. And then uh, and this is actually a fuzzy carved, fuzzy edge, I remember, and so on and so forth. On here, there's a texture that you kind of like, what's going on with that? And that's a trick I learned from this uh, 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 Japanese fellow who teaches at uh, Wesleyan, uh, Keiji. Uh, I was asking him, how do, you, how do you do those on the edges of these? He says, anyway, his eyes got a little bigger, and he said, super glue. <laughs> so that's super glue. KG uses a lot of super glue. So super glue reacts as a resist, and the block doesn't take the pigment as well, and so you can you can build up. So you're always using the same block when you when you do one of those. So that's all the same block. You're not you're not. There are two blocks here for for color. Well, there are two blocks here. I know, um, and um, here there's one, two, three, four, maybe five blocks. Uh, this print probably has ten or twelve blocks. Yeah. How many proofs near completion or complete prints would you say you've made at this time in your life? What? How many? How many? How many prints? complete prints or near completion to a final state? Oh yeah. How many edition prints have I have I issued? Because yes. Kunisada, they think, did about thirty thousand. Hokusai, Hokusai, they think, did about eighteen hundred. And Kunisada, like 30,000. Incredibly prolific. That, that, that artist there. I don't think I'm going to match that. <laughs> I've probably done maybe 100. Do you, have you counted how many you've done so far? Prints? Yeah. Print projects? In 10 years, probably yeah. uh, 40. 100. Oh, you think 100? Maybe more. Yeah. 120, maybe. But for every complete print, you also do about 300 of each. And that second or third state. So in total, the amount of actual physical prints that you've done probably range a lot higher. Oh yeah, and the th I mean, you know, there are editions of three th 300, and so they're, yeah, they're in the, th you know, I sell some thousands of prints a year. It's, it's going right along, and so, there's a, yeah. Yeah, I mean, one of the ideas with prints, and, and one, one thing that's really neat about prints in a way, making prints, is you, you leave quite a paper trail in your work. So, you can see where you've been, you know, and you can and you can. Say, oh, what if I did it with the different colors? And for color work, it's you know you can really develop color work because you can see, you know, what is it like with with, out the you know what is that like without the yellow. And in fact, I can get the yellow block out and print it a little differently, just like that. Boom, and see and compare it with the other one. And it, you know, it's quite a conversation in that way. Whereas if you're painting or drawing, you know, you, I guess you could take pictures as you go along, but you don't, you don't create this paper trail. And, and 
these prints particularly, and I saw it in that first experience with that Hiroshige show, I, 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 I felt like I could see that in a way, um, you know, the, I remember at that time the question, well, where, where, where's the, what's the work of art? What's the finished piece? You know, it's a bunch of prints. Well, is it the blocks or, you know, what, what, where, where's, the, where's the artwork? And the artwork is kind of in the process or in the, you know, and, and I remember having the experience at that time. I was also taking oil painting classes and I sell this oil painting and it bummed me out because it was gone. <laughs> and it was like all that effort and it was something to do with my wife and child. And it was very special. And then it was gone and I just was like, that, that's not going to work for me. I can't do that. <laughs> but the print, you can justify a great deal of time and work on those blocks because they become the means for this, this uh, adventure, uh, which Martha might remember in the classes I use uh, often, uh, I call it the theater analogy. And so I think of the, and the, all these prints are dated month and year when they're printed. And so I, I think of each batch as kind of like a performance. Maybe it's one night's performance, or maybe it's, yes, it's one night's performance. And then the addition is like the production, and sometimes they'll remake, you know, hire some new actors, and that's a second state addition. And that, yeah. Do the blocks degrade over time? Not very much. The, so the, the first print is a lot different from the last print? Well, they are different, but the difference is, is, is largely because there's a lot of handwork in the making of these prints. And the printmaker and the blocks have learned to print better. So I tend to hang on to, you know, 300 out of 300 and, and, and think of those as better prints than one out of 300 which is different from intaglio prints where you have an actual wearing of, you know, an etched copper plate, for instance. Yeah, well, we'll the, the print itself will just not be as crisp and whatnot. That's not the case here. This is a um, uh, print that's built out of a lot of, uh, there, there's a lot of levels of craft, getting better at the fades, getting to know your colors better. The blocks actually get more saturated with color and they print better. Eventually, they wear down. The Japanese prints, you can see them when they, they printed them in the thousands, and you can see prints that were made from worn blocks. And yeah, that, you know. But that's, you're getting way up there in yeah. quantities. Yeah. When the, water, when the water is on the block, does it change the, like too much water, does it absorb and make the block oh. get, change the shapes? The edges. You're 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 uh, 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 you're inspiring an idea. Let's let's try a print with like you know kind of a wild idea with a lot of water and some kind of crazy pigment and see what happens. Doesn't the wood absorbs the water though and change even at the edges? Even if you did the, use the right amount of water. What what's the question? I would think that the wood would expand with the amount of water in it, even if you use the correct amount of water. You, know I mean? you mean actually change size? It would change the shapes that you had carved. Yeah, yeah, I think it would. I, 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 one thing that is, you know, in, in fact, printing these editions of all these prints and stuff, you, you know, it's pretty repetitive work. It's not really that boring because there's always stuff going on. A little more water. Oh, look what happened there. Oh, look, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a pretty alive, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, I love this printing method, I, you know, I, I think it's neat. Um, and, and that's the topic of wood and water. We didn't really get onto that topic so much, but, but um, there's something about working with wood and water, you know, there, you know, and, that, and that's true, you know, wood is an endlessly alive material to work with. Yeah, here we'll just hand that print right around. Kind of crazy. Look at it. Look at that. Pass it right around. Yeah. Now, would you do two or three hundred iterations of those five, or just the end one? 
So these are labeled working proof, WP. This is um, first state edition was 200, and I think I did all 200. Second state, I didn't go over, I did like 20 of them, if I remember. I have some records somewhere. I didn't go very far, and I was like, you know what? You gotta move some mountains around here. You gotta change some stuff. <laughs> so, so I did. I, this is a shape that wasn't here, and, and uh, uh, what did I do? Well, mostly, that was already in there. I cut a new sky block. I got, I got rid of that pattern in the sky. And then, and then I changed the way the shapes, I mean, in a way it's subtle stuff, but once, you know, this is my world and I move in there, these are big changes. I were big changes in the mountains for me. Yeah. Um, we mentioned mountains earlier on, and um, we didn't really get to that. I'd like to ask a little bit about sense of place. You've talked a lot about um, the way you do things, but why these places? What do they mean to you? Why use this subject matter uh, for all this energy and oh, attention? Great question. <laughs> yeah, how many people here enjoy getting up on the mountain, up in the mountains? Yeah. Yeah, so what is it about mountains? Um, I'm a sometime churchgoer, and there's just, you know, when, 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 the, when the imagery comes up that's uh, mountain-related, you know, in Scripture or something, I'm like, oh, cool. And, and it's the same, just getting up. Um, yeah, I love the white mountains, but um, uh, sometimes it's just a little mountain. Sometimes, you know, just as a little... I think a big part about that is I'm going to connect it up to sort of a favorite theme that's been going on since my discussions with Ming about visual perception. I think where our visual perception and how we see our world is a lot more dynamic than we think in this age of the camera and fixed photography. That actually the way we see, and this is based on what Ming was saying and how I experienced it in making pictures, how we see it has a lot more to do with how we move through things, how we connect things. And uh, he, for instance, mentioned that um, the whole topic of, of AI, computers recognizing kanji and the and Japanese and Chinese character was a real stumbling block. And it turns out that a big part of the sense and meaning in, in, in those uh, written language forms has to do with our empathy with the movement of the brush. And when you get up in the mountains, you just sense the movement of our earth, the way it gets made. And, you know, you physically move up in there, but it's, it's all about, and the, and the clouds are moving and the light is changing, and it's just, you're just more aware of how we live on an earth that's about change and movement and, and how our experience of life and our actual, and it's a visual thing. I mean, this is what Ming and we're telling each other is if you're a maker of pictures, you know, my opinion, the main thing that you want to be thinking about is how do we move through that picture space? How do we move the, your eye through that picture? That's how I, you know, that's the main thing I'm thinking about. Like, how do you move through that picture space? And mountains are great. Um, uh, you know, I like the ones of the oceans and stuff. I mean, this one that, that I'm, you know, this most recent print here, to put the road in there is a way of just saying, this is about movement and, and you know, moving into that mountain above it. And, and uh, uh, I mean, does somebody want to jump in and speak about it? You know, um, this one here with the skier, the, uh, it's um, Tuckerman's from Wildcat. No. Wildcat, and, and yeah, for me, it's just it's it's the feeling of the skier going down the ski slope, but then it's also the feeling of across the not a notch, the scoops and shapes of the mountains, and how you move through that picture, and uh, uh, yeah. So do you see the world with, or do these things come out of your perception of the world with a frame around it? Yeah, <laughs> I know. Um, so. So it, it's sort of interesting, about a few years ago, I was like, 
oh, you know, you got to you got to get onto some different size. You've been doing this size for a while. You got to do something different. So I started in on these square prints and I talked a fair amount about it. I talked to my friend Carl about it. I talked to uh, Michael Verne is a dealer of Japanese prints and he goes to the print fairs. And Michael said, oh, I don't know, square prints, I don't know, they're hard to sell. And Carl said, oh, square prints are hard to make. And they were, <laughs> and they were. And now that I'm on to this new kick, in a way, through this, basically this Kunisada is my new teacher. And in the, the, these Japanese prints, everybody worked that same size. They lived in that world. And there's a, there's a, a way of saying it. Um, it was a professor at college. I remember her saying, yes, that's it. Limits are form. And right now, I'm feeling quite happy to be pursuing. I've got a bunch of new imagery with that, this vertical size. That's my, you know, you're going to see more of them. Yeah, I, I'm not going to reinvent sizes. Um, Oh, last weekend at the print fair, these print dealers are dealing with all these prints of all these different sizes, and it's such a hassle when they're packing up, and I just pop mine all in the same box. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and this, yeah, if you're a dealer of Japanese prints, it's not, not hard, because everybody works the same size. Yeah, Petey. Where you're going now with challenging yourself with your work? I know you're working a really large piece with Bill. Oh, yeah, let's get that. Yeah. So, um, so in this project, Bill Hayes and I uh, maybe you should stand up, Bill, so people can see. <laughs> We've busted all kinds of. <laughs> uh, yeah, you want to come help me hold it? Um, so. We did. We, 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 we got into new turf for both you and I on a number of uh, right. levels. We were, the at, yeah. we were at a show at Francesca Anderson's gallery in Lexington, Lexington, Mass. And Matt said, you know what we should do? We should do a collaboration. And, and I know the print to do it. We'll take one of yours and we'll do it large. Big. You know, we, you haven't done a big one. I said, no, I haven't. I don't have a press. I see. Everything that he's described about printmaking, I don't do. <laughs> everything. Yeah, yeah. We, we, except, we work differently. Except for the carving tools, right. everything else different. is different. You're on linoleum, you're with oil inks. Right. And, and you're I reduction. Use, and I use right. press and I do reduction right. printing. So he prints with multiple right. blocks, I print with one. Right. And so we bought uh, pieces of MDF. Yeah, we uh, neither of us have ever carved it before. It's particle board, yeah. And um, we cut them all to the same size, and we, uh, these are the three blocks that I've carved. Yeah. And now it's Matt's turn. Uh -huh. So Matt's going to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a composition then, that's that's from a, yeah. a, a five by seven print that I did. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a it's a it's a beautiful image, and uh, there, there's already some lovely stuff coming on in here. And uh, yeah, stay tuned, you know? Yeah, stay tuned. You know, what, what he was talking about, you were talking about carving. He carves very differently than I do. I, I, I think of it as, I, I carve in, in motion, but slow motion. He carves fast. <laughs> yeah. He's fast. He's always moving. <laughs> <laughs> so we're printing this. On a press, he has a Griffin press that nice is spectacular. Early 20th century. Oh, I think it's newer. Well, I think it's newer than that. It looks like it's early 20th yeah. century <laughs> with a, a massive yeah. steel bed, and um, and because the block is is large, it's about 30 by 22. Uh, we uh, working like this is is extremely difficult. But didn't we do, we did some of it with a just with, with baron. a baron? Did, None of it. Oh, we did it on the press. Okay. Yeah. But, First, we, th this, this was just a proof. It was done with water-based right. inks, and we were not paying attention to color at no. all. No, but our idea is to mix water and oil right. in the same way we'll see. <laughs> but you know, some blocks are oil and some blocks water. That's our basic. Right. So. The later blocks will be oil. Uh, they'll be more intense colors. Yeah. yeah. So, so see how it goes. Get, get posted. Stay tuned. Yeah. yeah.
Do you ever use blocks from one print series and move them on into a new print series? And oh, yeah. Like, uh, well, there are some, there's, there's a, I don't know if it's in this exhibit. There are some that got reworked quite a little bit. You know, the image got changed. Um, but you wouldn't be like, oh, I, you know, I kind of need a mountain in this one and maybe take from that one and slide it over and <laughs> no, see no. how that feels? Yeah, no, no, I mean, I mean, if you look at, you know, and we could do a little more printing. I, I, uh, in fact, uh, Petey's question, where, where are we going? I, you know, I want to I wanna ch check in with you guys because it's probably, is it 6.30 now? So, so um, you know, we could do a little more printing or something. But no, I mean, um, the drawn idea, I mean, actually, the, the printing really is the craft part. There's a lot of art in it. But the art part, the basic image idea, the where you start, that's huge. And um, yeah, you might start with an idea that comes off. When I'm teaching the class, I encourage people, there's a way that we get started and we draw and we talk about how, how to develop drawings and, and, and develop print ideas. But in a lot of ways, well, one thing about this method is I can take any printed sheet and paste it down to another block and, and you can carve right in. And, and it, because, because when I'm, um, oh, here's an example of it. Um, uh, we, we, had, we were doing a little video shoot last night and I just did a paste of a, of a of, on, uh, just to show the, 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 the actual way that you build off of an existing block is you print it and, um, and then rub the fiber off the back of the paper, leaving just the surface layer of the paper so you can see through to carve. That's one of the tricks, one of the Japanese tricks. So that's how the, this method becomes open-ended. And, and you also put oil on it, don't you? Yeah, I, I let it dry, then add a little oil. And you can see quite well, well, this is what this is. So we're looking through a paper pasted face down on the block, and you can see uh, the other. And that's, that's how you can get the different blocks to work together, which was one of the first questions I had when I got this idea. Was, well, how do you get the blocks to, you know? by this carving process and I'm, I'm not tracking, I'm trying really hard. So you start with a drawing face down yeah. on the block and it gets chewed up, doesn't it? You're cutting through it, I mean. Yeah, yeah. once you paste it, yeah, the drawing's pasted. Yeah. So you're working for multiple copies of it? Well, yes, I mean, Kunisada, back in the, those days, they didn't have Xerox machines, but we have a Xerox machine. And, and it turns out you can use regular office paper. And pa all paper is made in layers and has this quality. And you can, you can rub the fiber off the back of the paper. And, uh, and yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and you can get these fine levels of detail. I mean, I, I, I'm, how much of the texture comes from the inks and the way you're applying it? And how much of the texture is built into the block? Well, it's the two things in conversation. Um, there's a fellow who's no longer alive, but he taught at NYU for quite a few years. He, he studied in Japan, Bill Payden. And he said, well, some printmakers are all about the carving, and some printmakers are all about the printing. I'm a printing printmaker. He tended to have simple shapes in his prints, but he really worked his colors. He really worked on his colors and how they got printed and all. And his prints were largely abstract, not entirely. And um, the, the, the Japanese prints, in a way, are a lot about the carving. The, you know, that you get this fine hair and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, Bill, Bill Hayes' prints, there's some really amazing carving going on in his prints. I think of him as, but you know, you're about the printing too and the colors, but. It's, it's, it's a conversation. Yeah. Another question. How many prints do you think you made for that particular 
one behind Like you. how many proofs? Or? To yeah, totally. I mean, last night we were sort of setting up. I was cleaning up the shop a little to do this little video shoot thing. And there's a print I'm working on which got been stuck for about 10, 15 years. And I, I mean, there's a stack of paper. Oh, my word. The hours that went in. So some of them take a long time. A lot of proof printing. A lot of rehearsals. Yeah. A lot of messing with it. How do you usually en end up your talks? Do you kind of gather and a little visiting like a, is there any food left over? And how, how do we, uh, yeah, because we could have, people might have one-on-one. -on -one. We could kind of come around. Maybe we'll do that. What's that? We can end it now if people can talk with you, um, you know, right. as, as, they, as they want. And with each other. Now you can battle out the energy theory of color. And, uh, thank you all very much.